Good evening, y'all. Hello. How about that for a countdown? You don't get that in theater. None of this, like, slow rolling start nonsense. Uh, hi! I hope you can hear me. I know the music volume is a little bit wonky for people. Mostly trying to find a level that we can all just jam to and uh, is not super duper overwhelming, but just fills a little space in this cool and quiet pad. Um, oh, let's get uh, let's get that timer started. I figure we'll uh, we'll give people like three minutes from stragglers like three minutes. We'll do a little slow open. Um, we'll get some things sorted out, and uh, then we'll get going. There's that countdown going. Um, and in the meantime, look at all these great people. Hi. Wow, this is kind of a wild world's colliding. So like it's part part theater people, part personal friends, part school friends, uh, part professional humans. I, I put it on Reddit. Maybe people show up from Reddit. If you're here from Reddit, hi. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll see who turns up tonight. Um, but I think we, we're gonna I'm gonna try and keep this to a tight 90. We're gonna try and make this a one act to like 90 minutes, no intermission, if we can. Um, I got a lot I would like to get to, but also like I don't think this will necessarily be the last one of these that we do, because you know talking about like the wide world of Arduino is like talking about the wide world of books. Like there's just a lot out there. Oh my goodness, John Kelly, Dylan Reno, <laughs> PF Janky. I'm pretty sure I know who you are. Kenneth Finnegan will be our moderator for tonight. Kenneth is a person I've known since I was 13, 12 or 13. So if there's somebody I can trust in the chat that feels like who it would be. Chris is <laughs> good luck with a 90. Yeah, I know these things tend to go on, but um, but I think we can really I think we can really keep it tight. I think we can really make this work. Let's do a little tidying up over here in the meantime. Let's see. We got a, a little a little fancier stream. Hey, Dylan, I saw you were out there. Um, Dylan Reno, big props, was here last Sunday night when my audio was super wonky. Turned out the microphone on my computer was also on. Um, and it was picking up things with like a slight, like a millisecond of offset. And so there was this really weird echoey artifacty thing, but only when I faced the computer. So hopefully things are a little bit better now. I guess we'll find out. Um, as we go along, but it, it seems like it's not been been super duper crazy. We're trying new technology. We're trying new things. Um, and it'll be great. We'll give people one more minute, and then uh, we'll just dive right in. <laughs> Kenneth says we'll be keeping people uh, <laughs> reputable and honest. Yeah. So uh, Kenneth uh, is a friend of mine who uh, is now a network engineer, system engineer, customer solutions expert for a networking company. So I'm glad this is not like a, a networking based stream. Otherwise, I'd feel like I was sort of in way over my head. But it's not, it's not what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, what we're talking about tonight in 26 seconds, we'll get to. What streaming software, Chris? Uh, OBS Studio, um, which is a free streaming software um, that's available for download with a little bit of a little bit of cord yeah, like, um, coordination. I got a couple of cameras going. I got my like laptop set up over here to do the screen. Um, Notes on masking your LEDs. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Lee is a, a lighting designer. <laughs> and of course, yeah, the, the janky LED tape that's in the back here is not not my finest work. But I did also, you know, I didn't go have to go out to get any supplies for it. <sighs> All right. So with the countdown done, let's dive in. So the, the point of what we're here doing tonight is... You know, I've been working with Arduino off and on for over a decade now, and there's all kinds of things you can do with it. But the thing that I hear the most, the things I hear the most are, what, what is it? Uh, what can I do with it? And how do I get started? Um, so I thought those would be the three things that we bang out tonight. We're going to talk about what an Arduino is, uh, what the possibilities are for what you can do with it. And then we're going to go from installing the software to writing and running your first code this evening. Um, so we're going to kind of shoot high and you know tell you what you can possibly do and then i want to give you some sort of first steps to get started and where you can look for more resources like i say we're not all going to become experts by the end of the night tonight because uh, because we wouldn't be here uh, you know we, we would be here past the end of the night tonight we'd be here until next week but we'll pick this up next week next sunday probably same time and we'll learn a little bit more by the way tonight is brought to you by noon whistles cosmo pale ale a delicious local brewery in uh, lombard illinois i hope you all have tasty drinks out there yourself because it's sunday night and you deserve it. Oh, 
It's just so good. So let's dive in. So now we're over here on this camera. This is going to be a fun thing for me all night as I have two web cameras and we're going to go back and forth. So I'm having a good time. I don't really care if you are. It's a good time for me. So Arduino, what is it? I swear there's only eight slides until we go into making stuff. So I'm, I'm so sorry. But also if you were hoping to like write this off for class credit, there are slides. So it's a class. What is Arduino? <coughs> it's a complicated question. Um, but I think the question we would stick a step back and ask is, what is a computer in general? An Arduino is a, a kind of small computer, so what do we mean by a computer? Well, uh, one broad definition for what a computer is, uh, is a device, this is it's the broadest possible definition, right? It's a device which takes some input, does some thinking, and produces some output. Um, and that definition is come up with by me today, and I think it's quite good. Um, and it, like, so you're thinking about things that in your life that are computers, right? Your laptop. Yeah, it takes some input, right? You click with a mouse or you press a key on your keyboard and the computer sees the electrical signals change that are coming into it. It does some thinking, with, you know, where is the mouse on the screen? What key was just pressed? What program am I in? And it produces some output, usually changes on the screen or uh, in a file or on the network interface or something like that, right? Input, thinking, output. And so that, that is a very broad definition of computer, right? That could describe a MacBook, that could describe a pocket calculator. Um, so in the world of Arduino specifically, let's break it down by those three things, like what kinds of inputs, what kind of outputs, and what kind of thinking you can do. So inputs uh, is a very broad category, and I'm sure I haven't covered anything. Um, buttons and switches, right? Anything that closes a circuit, whether it's a push button or a toggle switch or a slide switch or anything like that. Um, anything that, that makes or breaks a physical electrical contact can be used. Um, you might have a light sensor um, of many kinds or, or a literal camera. Um, cameras are a little trickier. We'll get to that in a sec, but it could be a sensor that senses the um, amount of light or the color of light that's coming in or the directionality of light. It could be a sound sensor, whether that's a sensor for a specific pitch, it could be a sensor for a specific volume or just a burst of sound, like say you were trying to make a drum head light up when you strike the drum with your mallets, right? Maybe you have a sensor that's just an impulse sensor for sound. Um, orientation, like a 3D accelerometer sensor. Um, GPS sensors are pretty common, right? That give you your, your latitude and longitude based on GPS. GPS modules sort of sidebar also tend to be really good um, clock modules, like give you a very stable clock, because for the GPS satellites to know where they are, they have to have very good built-in clocks, and so your GPS module, your GPS input, can also be a time input. Um, distance, like time of flight, you could have a radar sensor or a LIDAR sensor, like you're using in your self-driving cars these days, or I, I don't know if you are, but people are using in their self-driving cars. Um, radiation, you could have a, um, a, a tube that was amplifying radiation detecting alpha or gamma or what have you. Um, temperature and humidity are both common things, pretty straightforward. Rotation, right, if you have a gyroscopic sensor that's sensing whether you're turning one way or the other. Uh, weight or strain sensors. Data from the internet. Um, we'll get to why internet interactivity is not necessarily a basic function of Arduino, but you can hook it up to a network. Um, time can be an input. So not necessarily a time sensor, but just the passage of time itself could be part of the data that your computer, your Arduino is taking in and thinking about and using to do some of its processing. And then also stored data, right? So it, there's a small amount of memory built into the Arduino and you can save things as you run a program. So you could take different actions now based on what's happened in the past because you're able to store that data. This is like a, a little tiny list, but I hope this is starting to get you thinking if you've never worked with Arduino before, like, oh, interesting, maybe something that is triggered when um, when I put my bag down on the coffee table, there's a weight sensor there that does something. Um, or maybe when the radiation goes above, like, uh, th three grunts gen, I should, like, call the Russian government and tell them, you know, whatever. Um, just to start your brain churning on what you could possibly do. And the things you could possibly do, let's talk about outputs. Um, displays and screens. Right, so you could have a little seven segment display or a graphical display of some kind. Lights and LEDs are pretty straightforward, um, whether it's a high powered light or a little indicator light that tells you something's going on. You can make sound. There are ways to make sound with Arduino. Again, it's not necessarily one of the basic functions, um, but it is one that is possible, especially if you're doing tones or buzzing or something like that. Playing back of sound files is possible with some additional hardware. 
um, controlling motors, hydraulics, pneumatics, or any kind of motion control um, that you can think of. Um, hard networks, and by that I mean stuff like RS-485, like which is what DMX is based on, or RS-232, or LAN bus, which is what like an ETC paradigm system, for those who know that system, it's like a, a wall lighting control system it's based on. You know, all those kinds of networks, industrial networks that are not ethernet based, those are all possibilities. Internet endpoints, so again, so like internet networking is not necessarily a basic function of Arduino, but it is possible. Um, data storage, you could write to either local storage or say to an SD card um, or another storage device to accumulate data over time. And then really like whatever else you can think of. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the pizza output would look like, but again, you start thinking about like, well, what are all the possible things I could do with a motor or a linear actuator that moves in time? You know, maybe when the temperature in the pizza oven reaches 750 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's been at least four minutes since I put the push the pizza in button, a motor will activate until it hits a strain sensor to know it's hit the pizza. You know, these things can all start to chain together. So as you're thinking about like, what can Arduino do? It's really better to think about what inputs am I interested in chaining to what outputs, if that sort of makes sense. I should also say, as we're as we're jumping in here, I've done a, a fair amount of work to try and get the latency down. So if you want to ask questions in real time, you pretty much can. Um, depending on where you are, there's maybe like a five or 10 second delay between you sending it and me seeing it on the screen. Um, but jump in with questions and we'll, we'll just answer what we can. So we did inputs, we did outputs. The piece in the middle is the thinking and that's the coding portion. Um, and in, in really broad terms, right, if you've never encountered Arduino or even programming before, here's how to think about what the thinking portion of it does. Some, some things it can do. Um, it can um, store and remember information, right? So it can uh, say that this, uh, this data value, you know, the, the temperature has been below 30 degrees for at least 24 hours. I remember that. I can now turn the heater on so it warms up or whatever it is. Um, you can do conditional thinking. There's a number of ways to do that. And I think we'll get to that tonight, um, which is to basically say what we sort of we've been talking about so far. Like if such and such inputs are true, then do this other thing. Um, and that's sort of the core of, of stringing together these inputs and outputs so that things are doing what you want them to do. You can also do a fair amount of mathematical processing, right? So um, you maybe need to make a decision not based on the distance that something is away, but the total area of a room. Let's say you had two distance sensors at a right angle. You could make a little Arduino powered device that would calculate the, the area of your room by taking two distances to two adjacent walls and multiplying them together. Um, you can do trig functions with Arduino, you know, so any, any sort of mathematical process you can define. Um, and then sort of a deeper concept, which we're, we probably won't touch on too much tonight, is that remembering individual bits of data is useful, but storing data in a structured way can often be a lot more useful. So going back to, you know, it's been below 30 degrees for 24 hours, you know, it would be a real kind of pain if we had to individually designate, like, this is a spot where I store data from 24 hours ago, and this is a spot where I store data from 23 and a half hours ago, and so on. There are structured ways to build either lists or charts or maps of all these various things that can simplify the process of, of retrieving and using that data later. That's a little bit vague on the hand wavy, I know. We probably won't touch on data structures too much tonight, but just know that like, as you're thinking about the data storage part of this, there are intelligent ways to go about it. So that's what Arduino can do. And I hope this is starting you to think about like, oh, interesting. Well, is there a sensor out there for um, blood alcohol leather, like a breathalyzer sensor? <laughs> yes, there is. What could, you know, uh, uh, you could make an Arduino powered device that uh, when you get into your car, you have to blow into the blood alcohol sensor. And if it's above a certain level, it knees you in the gut. Like, you know, as you think about hooking inputs to outputs, you know, think expansively. The Arduino itself is a physical programmable circuit board, which we often call a microcontroller and the software that goes with it. Um, and the reason that Arduino kind of has become the dominant, I would say microcontroller in the world is that it's really easy to use. Before Massimo Bonsi and, and his associates and his predecessors sort of launched this project in the mid 2000s, there were small like microcontrollers before, but they were expensive and kind of cumbersome to program. Um, and so in, in, by that, I mean, you would write your code, you would uh, run one program to turn it into a language that the microcontroller could understand. You could run another program to get it onto the microcontroller itself using another bit of hardware. It was just a cumbersome process. And so the point of the Arduino project was to make a board that was very simple to hook up to your computer, 
and came with a simple to use program to get your information, get your code onto it. And that's the Arduino. This is a picture of a, a very early one, which doesn't even have a USB port. You can see here it has this, uh, this serial port on it. All the modern ones have USB. You just hook them up to your computer. Well, you hook them all up to your computer with a USB cable, whether it's built in or not. We'll get there. Today, the Arduino Uno R3 is the most common. If you're thinking like what an Arduino looks like, you're probably thinking of it. Um, here, I've got one just over on the table here. Um, there are many different flavors of Arduino, but this is sort of the most common form factor. Um, and it's got a, you know, a nice USB connector here. It's got a DC input jack for shooting power into it. Lots of easy points to plug wires in and things. Um, and then just, just for your reference, like there are lots of other possibilities, right? You can go bigger, you can go more power, more connectivity. You can go smaller, usually not much less like powerful, but um, smaller form factors. Um, the mini, the micro, the pro variants have that. Um, in the past couple years, we've seen ones that are uh, sort of maker friendly, that they're meant, you don't have to like solder anything or hook up anything. You can use like alligator clip wires to hook onto them. Um, uh, Adafruit makes a bunch of them, A-D-A-F-R-U-I-T.com. Great website, currently closed, but when they come back up, check them out. Um, and they're all basically the same. They use basically the same software. And I say basically because like, you know, a few of the variants have ethernet built in. And so they have special code to handle doing ethernet. If you don't have ethernet on your board, you can't run the ethernet code, right? But essentially they all do the same things. Ah, so this is one last little thing. I think this is the last slide before we jump into actually making things and, and looking at software. Um, what is Arduino less good at? And I put a Raspberry Pi up here for two reasons. And for those who haven't seen it, that's a Raspberry Pi. Um, and people say, well, you know, why would you use an Arduino versus a Raspberry Pi? Well, in general, an Arduino is not going to be as good at computery things. Um, things like uh, hooking up to a USB keyboard and mouse. It can be done, um, but it's not what Arduino is sort of best at. Um, similarly, hooking up to like a high res monitor. Um, and pushing out a lot of data or, or doing a lot of sophisticated networking, um, running apps and programs, dealing with uh, dealing with files that can do OK. Um, but anytime you're thinking like, oh, this would want to run on a computer and deal with displays, um, control peripherals or the Internet, you're probably thinking more of a single board computer solution of which the Raspberry Pi is, is the most common. They can both do a lot of the same things. You know, a lot of things you can accomplish with an Arduino, you can accomplish the Raspberry Pi and vice versa. Um, but that's sort of where I fall. It's like, oh, I'm gonna need this to ultimately put things out on a monitor. I'll do it on a Raspberry Pi. Um, I just need to control some motors and some buttons in real time. I'm gonna do that in an Arduino. Um, the, the big difference at the core is that the Arduino does what you tell it to do and nothing else. Right? It's a microprocessor. It does exactly what you want at all times. Whereas a computer needs to manage a lot of different things at once. Right? It's got to tell the screen what to display. It's got to remember where the mouse is and whether it's being clicked. It's constantly got to be pushing sound out to your ears, right? just changing that voltage to make the sound come out. So it's doing a lot of work in the background to make all these things happen at the same time, which means you don't have as precise control of what exactly is happening in there. But it's very useful if you need those things to happen. Does that sort of make sense? I think so. I think that'll be good. Ah, great. So this is the last slide for now. Um, shout out questions, and when you got them, um, I'm gonna real quickly go through where to find the Arduino programming software and how to download it if you haven't already. Um, it's a straightforward process, so if you have questions, now's a good time to drop them in the chat. So um, the Arduino homepage is arduino.cc. It's linked in the description of this stream. And if you go to, on the website, software and downloads, um, you will have an option to use a web editor. You can actually do all of your coding online. And if you log in, oh, here, I can do this better. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, if you log in, it'll save all of your code and you can kind of use it anywhere. I sort of prefer having a local copy of all of my software. Not sort of, I do prefer having a local copy of all my software, but this is kind of an interesting option. Um, but if you're not doing that, you go down the page a little bit to the most current version of Arduino, which is 1.8.12. You can install it for your system of choice. Um, if you are using a computer that you don't have admin rights on, so you can't actually install software, um, at least for Windows, this is a good option. You can download a zip file. You don't actually have to install. You just unzip the file and just run the program, which is pretty niche. Um, you can get it in the Windows App Store, and then there's Mac and Linux versions as well. Um, I'm not gonna run the full installer at this time because I'm really worried I'm gonna bork my software right before this uh, demo all starts, which would be a real shame. Um, but essentially, 
I pre-downloaded it earlier. I think it's going to yell at me that I already have it installed. And we'll just see what happens. Yes, do you want to uh, make changes to my device? I do. Yes, now it's going to yell at me. I already have it installed, which is good. Basically, you just click yes to all the defaults. It's going to ask you to install some drivers, right? This is how it's going to communicate between the computer and the Arduino itself. It has to install some software drivers. Just say yes, um, and then you should be good to go. Justine says, what sort of things have you used Arduino for at work? Oh, a handful of things. Um, let's see. Well, I was at Chicago Shakespeare Theater. Um, we built a Q-Light controller out of an Arduino um, that read the inputs from seven, uh, seven switches and a master switch. Did some thinking. This is going to be the metaphor of the night. Did some thinking about, you know, what, what light should be on or off based on the state of the master switch and the state of the Q-Light switches. And then actually output the data over SACN um, to the lighting network, streaming architecture for control networks, which is a, a lighting control protocol that goes over a network, which is a pretty basic protocol that's something that an Arduino can handle. Um, what, now I'm at the Museum of Science and Industry, and I actually use an Arduino um, in the past few weeks. We had uh, an exhibit which um, basically heats up a chunk of metal, causing it to do something interesting, and then it has to cool back down before it can do that interesting thing again. And the display on it, the, the countdown timer that tells the guests when it's cool again, broke, and they don't make them anymore. So I used an Arduino to read in the serial stream that was coming out of the PLC, um, decipher that data, and then drive an individual seven-segment display that we built into our own housing in it. Um, so that was pretty cool. Those are the two that come to mind, I think. Um, PF Jank says, began exploring Arduino software a while back and lost with example programs were about looping or repeating a task. Is there a way to program it to standby slash run when, ah, uh, so when triggered and then stop and stand by again? That's a great question. Um, and I'm gonna put it on pause until we talk about programming structure in a little bit, because um, I think it'll make more sense for the people who are who are following along. So on that note, let's launch our Arduino software. While it's launching, Arduino and Genuino are the same thing. There was a weird copyright trademark dispute a few years back where some of the owners and founders thought they owned Genuino, Arduino, so Genuino is the genuine Arduino. It's all the same thing now. I wouldn't worry about it too much. So when you launch your software for the first time, you will probably be confronted with something more like this. This is the barest bones of an Arduino program. Um, and we'll continue to come back to this structure, but the gist of it is um, you have a setup block, a setup function. So anything between these two curly brackets will be code that runs once and only once when you give power to the Arduino. And then it will run anything that's in between these two curly braces in the loop section over and over and over and over again forever. Um, so sort of like their names imply, you would put code in the setup section that's preparatory, like declaring, you know, what things are going to be inputs and outputs, or, you know, if I need some time to start up my Ethernet connection and there's some special code that has to do that, it would go in the setup section. And in the loop section might be all of the interesting stuff that would, you know, do things in response to inputs and outputs. Let's see. <laughs> yes. Oh, also the candle controller in Graveyard Shift. Yeah. Um, Marcus is mentioning a, a thing I did for the good and that um, takes in a uh, Arduino-powered device that takes in a DMX signal and spits out IR commands over IR LEDs to a number of candles that are distributed all over the stage. Um, to, they're just little tiny, I think I have one here actually, don't tell Gina. I have a little tiny, you know, awful candle that just takes a little IR remote. Um, but on a DMX signal, this device blasts about 10 watts of IR light over the stage and turns them on or off. So again, like thinking about like, oh, it, you know, what am I using to trigger it? What am I using to come out of it? Inputs and outputs right? So this is our, this is the gist of our code, but I think what might be more, more interesting is to show you some, some code that's actually working. And especially if you've just bought an Arduino, or if after this you go out and buy an Arduino, what you might actually see going on. So let's go to, let's go to this view. <laughs> this is going to be the most fun view of the night because I am now a, a two camera shot. Um, but when you buy an Arduino, it will come with a sketch preloaded on it called Blink. Um, you can find it in the Arduino code editor itself, um, but every Arduino I've ever bought came preloaded with this code. And all it does is it takes this little onboard LED, I'm just gonna shade it from the light there, and it blinks on and off at half a hertz, right? On for one second, off for one second, on for one second, off for one second. Um, and so I thought it might be useful to start with that small bit of code and sort of break it down a little bit and show you how it functions. 
So uh, if you're looking for this in your IDE, I can look over here too. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Um, if you go up to File, go to Examples. In the basic examples, if you go to this blink sketch here and load that, that's what we're looking at. Um, so like we were talking about, there are two chunks of code. There's this setup chunk and this loop chunk. Um, so the setup code will run once and the loop code will run over and over again forever. I should point out any lines that are preceded by this double backslash are what's called comments. Um, and they're exactly what it sounds like. It's bits of text that we put into our text document here to remind ourselves of useful things or make notes that the Arduino is never gonna see. The program on the computer is gonna edit all that out before it uploads it to the Arduino, right? So useful for things like this is initialized digital button, digital pin, LED built in as an output, right? So let's break that down a little bit. We have here, it's done some nice color coding for us. You know, let's, um, while we're here, get that a little bigger. That's a little better. Um, we have this command, this function called pin mode. And for those who haven't run into them before, a function is how we tell the Arduino or the computer to do something. Um, in this case, the pin mode function tells one of the Arduino pins what, well, what kind of mode it should be in. Um, a pin, and we're gonna go into hardware in just a second here. A pin is basically a point of connection to the microcontroller. So on, on the Arduino itself, any of these places, any of these connections where you can shove a wire in, those are pins. There are a few pins that are specific to the microcontroller that don't have these output connections because they don't need them. Um, but when we say pin, you can think of point of connection, right? So, uh, so this pin mode function is going to take one of these pins, in this case, the pin associated to the built-in LED, uh, and make sure that it's an output. Um, because to run this blink sketch, we want to be able to output some power to this LED, right? Cool. So then, so that runs once, right? It sets it up as an output, and then we're going to run this loop function over and over and over again forever. And the loop function has just these four lines, and there's two functions within it that we should know. Digital write uh, takes a pin, uh, specifically an output pin, and either pulls the voltage up on it to high or down to ground. And we'll go we'll get more detail about that in a second, but just go with me here, right? So up to high, down to ground. And in this case, we're telling it, which pin do we want? Well, the LED built-in pin. And this is really only here a shorthand because on different boards, it could be connected to different pins, but the Arduino knows where the LED is, so to speak. So we just use this LED built-in shorthand. So first set it to high, which turns the LED on. Then we have this delay function and delay uh, only takes one parameter here, which is the number of milliseconds to literally wait and do nothing, right? So a thousand milliseconds is one second. Uh, then we, again, we have a similar, we have a digital write to turn the LED pin off by setting this to low, and then we wait for a second. And that's literally all that this code is. Before we mess with it, let me show you how to get it onto your Arduino if you've never done that before. Um, there's a few ways. If you go up to the sketch menu at the top here, you can hit upload. You can also click on the little right hand arrow icon here that will upload, or you can do control U or command U depending on your system. You'll see this area down here clear, you'll see it uploading, and it should say done uploading down here. And when you are, you should have your code on your Arduino. There we go. So very simply, uh, if we start to mess with some of the values in this program, like if I could say, I want this to delay for 500 milliseconds, re-upload, come back over here. And now it's only waiting half a second in between turning on and off, right? So by changing the values that are in these functions, we can change what's happening in the code exactly like we want to. Um, so before we go on too far, I want to get just a little bit more detailed about the hardware because we're using these terms high and low and pins. Um, and I want to make sure that that's clear going forward so we can really understand what's going on. So what are the pins on an Arduino? over here no we're over here uh a quip sip of a cold frosty oh, it's so good so this is a blown up uh not exploded this is an enlarged view of the arduino uno rev3 the, the board we are looking at over here um, and this is a, an indication of what all the different pins, all these different points of connection can do. So 
to break it down simply, you'll see over here on this side, you can see the mouse, I hope, I hope. Over here on this right side, um, you'll see we have all these pins labeled D0, D1, D2, and so on up to D19. And actually we have some more over here, D14 through D19. Anything with a D is a digital pin. Um, and that means it can do digital inputs or digital outputs, right? So we think back to our, our high school math classes, digital means ones and zeros, right? Either on or off. And that's basically what we're doing with this built-in LED right now, right? Either it's on or it's off. Um, and similarly, we could send a signal into it to turn it on, you know, to see whether something is on or off. Um, and we will, we'll get to that later today. Um, in addition to that, these pins can do some other things. The ones noted here with the little squiggly next to them, and this diagram, by the way, is linked in the description of this stream. Um, the squiggly ones, which are D3, 5, 6, 9, 10, and 11, can do analog output as well of a sort, um, can do dimming or pulse width modulation for those who know what it is. Um, and then the ones over here that have an ADC number by them can do analog input. So they can sense voltages um, other than just high and low. They can do some analog voltage sensing. Then the other pins you've got here are there's a few places where you can connect to ground. Um, you've got a 5 volt and a 3.3 volt supply pin uh, over on one side here. You have a V in pin. So if you're powering this not off of uh, USB, but off of an external power supply, let's say off of 9 volts or 12 volts, this V in pin will be exactly what you're putting in from your power supply. So that might be useful. Um, IO ref and A ref, A ref has to do with um, uh, analog inputs. IO ref is based on what kind of power supply you're providing to it. And this reset pin, if you pull it to ground, you'll reset the Arduino. Don't, don't get used a whole lot, but they're there if you need them. And then there's actually, there's one hole um, that doesn't do anything, right? It's just there in case they decide to use it in a future design. Um, I should say, all of these are almost always silk screened onto your Arduino for reference and usually in a pretty decent way. So you can see like there I've got, you know, my three with a squiggle. So it does analog output five, six. I've got my a little hard to see there, but you can get analog, analog sensing three volts and five volts. So you don't necessarily need to memorize this chart, right? It's just a useful reference as we're looking through things. You can see the mouse. That's great. Thank you. Um, so to talk just a little second about um, when we said we set a pin high uh, for a certain amount of time, we set a pin low, what does that mean? Well, uh, in the context of a 5-volt Arduino, and most of them are 5 volts, there are some that run at 3.3 volts. Um, so check when you're, when you're buying, especially if you're buying an AliExpress or something. But most of the time, we're talking about a 5-volt device, high means on means 5 volt, and low means off means 0 volt or ground in this case. Palmer says, oh, Brian says, does the reset button wipe out your program? No, no, the reset uh, pin, if you pull it low, or if you press the reset button here, that's present, right? All that does is start you over from the beginning, right? It'll run your setup code once, and then it will loop again and again and again forever. Oh, Ken's got it. Yeah, there we go. Um, come back over here. Um, so just to illustrate, right, high is on is 5 volts, low is off is 0 volts, right? So for our blink code that we're running now, here's essentially, here's essentially what's happening. Um, we start, well, at 0 volts probably. When we run our digital write command, that pin, in this case the built-in LED pin, goes high, goes to 5 volts. Then we delay for a certain number of milliseconds. Then we run our digital write low command and that voltage on that pin drops to zero. Then we delay, then we go high and we delay and so on. And so basically this is the output that our code would produce. Um, I had planned to like show you this with a multimeter, but I think it'll actually make more sense when we hook it up to an LED later, unless we really, if you, unless we want to see it with a multimeter, we can, but I feel like we can do a more, a more interesting demo. Um, specifically, this, oh, here, before we get there, let's um, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, right? So now that we know a little bit about what it means for things to go high and things to go low, um, we can sort of look back through our code here and understand a little bit better what it means, right? So we set our LED built-in pin to be an output. We did a digital write to that pin to take it high, so we send it up to 5 volts. Then, in this case, we're waiting 500 milliseconds. Uh, then we, for that same pin, went to LED built-in low, and we delayed for 500 milliseconds, right? And that is still running over here. Yeah, there we go. Um, for what it's worth, this LED built-in pin I happen to know on this one is pin 13. So if I re-upload that code, it's going to do the exact same thing, right? It's the same, and there it is, blinking right away, right? Easy enough. Um, there's no reason we have to use that LED built-in pin. We could use any other pin that we want, like 
pin two. Right? So I'm upload that now. It's gladly uploading. Unfortunately, I don't have anything hooked up to pin two right now, so you just would have to trust me that that's what's happening. In fact, I think I am gonna show you on the multimeter just so you really get a sense of what's what's going on here. So I'm gonna, here, I'm gonna come back to the table, right? So I'm gonna take my bit of wire and sho shove it down into the pin associated to ground here. And I'm going to shove the other wire into the pin for digital two. I'm gonna take my multimeter, set it to DC volts. And I know before anyone says it, you should always measure across a load, but for the point of today's demo, I think it will be fine. Um, the other thing I'm gonna do is actually come back over to the code and make this a two second delay between state changes, just cause it's gonna take a little bit of time um, for this to show up. So we'll do that. We will upload that code. And let's see if I can get this all. It'd be embarrassing if the first demo doesn't work, but it, you know, that seems to be the way of things. Oh, there is two output, too high, too low. There we go. So you can see, if I get the shadows out of the way, right? So that voltage is about zero, then it jumps up to about five volts, then it jumps down to about zero, then jumps up to about five volts, then jumps down to about zero, right? So the same exact code we were running in our blink sketch with our built-in LED is now running on pin two, right? So you can see this a little bit more visually if I hook this up to an LED. Let's zoom out a little bit here. Um, and all this circuit is, just for those who are following along, and um, these slides, by the way, are, should be linked in the description of this. If they're not, I will make sure that it's linked in um, for posterity on YouTube. I should say, this was all going to be archived on YouTube, so if at any point you're like, that's enough for tonight, it'll be here at the same address when you come back. Um, so this is the circuit that we're wiring up now. Um, so from pin digital pin 2, uh, there is a resistor and an LED, and that will return directly to ground. The reason for the resistor is the Arduino, right, when it, we write a pin high, puts out five volts, but it can't produce an unlimited amount of current. In fact, about 20 milliamps is sort of uh, the maximum you can pull on a single pin. And there is also a global maximum power. You can't pull 20 milliamps on every pin simultaneously, and that limit will change depending on what species of Arduino you have. Um, so I picked a, a nice big resistor that's gonna limit our current to a much smaller value. Let me come back over here. So much like our circuit diagram, I'm going to take one wire, shove it into pin two, then take another wire and shove it into ground. And we'll see, there we go, our LED lights up. Lights up for two seconds, turns off for two seconds, and so on. Cool people sharing the archive link? Of course, of course. You know, I, I imagine we'll continue to keep doing these and I, I don't have any expectation that everyone watches every single one of them live. Um, so feel free to share or catch up when you can, um, just because I think it's interesting. Right? So to go back to our code for a second, all we did, let's see if this will be fine. Um, we're now doing the exact same thing that we used to do on the built-in LED now on this external pin, right? We did pin two, was an output, we wrote it high, we waited two seconds, we wrote it low, it waited two seconds, right? Um, so that's a certainly a possible thing. This is a really good chance to introduce the, well, this is a good chance to take questions, I think, now that we're, we're doing some things, and then we'll launch into the concept of variables. Um, while I wait for questions to come in, I'm going to take a sip of my Noon Whistle Cosmo Pale Ale, brought to you by Noon Whistle Brewing, all Bardo <laughs> uh, mm. uh, I'm having such a good time. I love this stuff. <sighs> and I hope you are too. Like, I, I have had a lot of people over time ask, or, or say, you know, in casual conversation, oh, Arduino seems so cool, I, I don't know where to get started. And so I'm hoping this sort of solves a, like, oh, we can do so many things, here's my impetus for what we might do, and also like, oh, here's logistically how we get started. Um, I'll keep keeping an eye out for questions, um, but in the meantime, I'm gonna talk a little bit about variables. So um, this code editor, the Arduino code editor, is a very basic one. Um, and like all computers and like all computer code, the Arduino will do exactly what you ask it to do as long as the syntax is correct, no more and no less. Um, so, for example, if syntax not being correct, right, every line you may have noticed ends with a semicolon. Um, that tells the code that that's the end of the line. So if I try and upload that, ooh, oh, <laughs> if I delete the semicolon and try and upload that, it says, ah, I expect to see a semicolon here, right? So you have to get your grammar correct. 
Um, but beyond that, it doesn't really know or care what you're doing. And by that, I mostly mean it doesn't take care of typos for you. So let me come down here and say digital write pin too high. Let's make this back to, I don't know, a, 500, a half a second delay. And I'll, let's say I made a typo and I said digital write pin five low. I'll upload that back to our Arduino. We'll come back over here. And now you see our LED is on forever, um, which is exactly what we told it to do, right? We said take pin too high, wait half a second, take pin five low, wait half a second, make pin too high again, right? So nothing's gonna change, right? So there is nothing that is protecting the you from making dumb user errors. Max volts for the V in pin. Um, it varies based on your model of Arduino. Um, for the Uno, I wanna say it's up to 18 volts. Um, for some of the other variants, like the Pro Mini, it's only 12 and it's kind of a sketchy one. Martha Templeton, two semicolons, uh, Let's find out. I'll show you. This is what you get for asking snarky questions. If I do two semicolons, it compiles just fine. So there you go. Um, where was I? Oh, the compiler, the, the coding program doesn't protect you from making stupid errors like replacing a two with a five. Um, and that's one of the main functions of a variable. A variable is just a name that we give to a piece of data. Um, and the way that we give it that name is something like this. Um, I will type it all out and then we'll explain it all. We're on the right view, yeah. So I'm gonna say int LED pin equals two semicolon. Um, so what that's doing is saying, I'm gonna declare a variable. It's gonna be of the type integer, um, in which in this case just means a number, a relatively small, less than 65,000 number. Um, I'm gonna give it the name LED pin. You can call it whatever you want. Like we could call this variable fart, 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 but it's usually good to give it names <laughs> that you're gonna, they're gonna mean something to you in your code later on. Um, and I'm gonna give it a value. I'm going to assign it a value of two. In this case, this equals operator is more properly an assignment operator. It says, hey, this variable called LED pin is two, right? Um, and then, so now I have this, this variable called LED pin, it's two. I can now replace my number two in my code with LED pin, LED pin, LED pin, LED pin, right? So now, when I upload that code, we come back over here and we can see everything's working again. Um, because of course it's consistent in all of those places, right? Everything is sort of acting on the same pin. The other nice thing about using variables is, uh, let's say I want to make a change to which pin I'm using. Let's say I want this to go back to pin 13, the built-in LED. Uh, if I had this written as 13, 13, 13, I'd have to not only make that change everywhere, but remember everywhere I had made the, used that number in my code. Um, that's sometimes called magic numbers, right? Where you just have a number sitting there and you don't explain what it is. It's much better practice and you'll thank yourself for it later if you encapsulate that into a variable. So you only have to change it in one place. So when I re-upload and come back over here, now it's on our built-in LED, right? So that's the idea of variables. They're just a name that we give to a piece of data, whether it's one that we start with at the beginning of our program or something, a value that we determine midway through our program or that might change over time. Um, one thing that I should mention, um, which I, I don't think we have yet, is how would you know um, what the different types of variables were uh, or what the different functions were if you weren't on a stream uh, with me telling you? Well. The place you would find out that information is also on the arduino.cc website. There's a link to this specific page in the description. Um, if you go to resources and reference, you come to the functions reference page. This is every function that the Arduino software knows about. So we have digital write that we learned about, pin mode. Uh, if we come down, we have our delay function. But this is a great place to explore and to get a little bit of a sense of like what Arduino can do. Um, you can tell it has some, uh, some tone function. That's interesting. Pulses, randomness. We have a lot of mathematics functions. We can do trig. And then down at the bottom, we have our different data types, right? Our int, our integer that we talked about, a long integer if you need to store a really long number, a Boolean, which is either true or false. Like this is a great place to, to sort of explore. And then down here, we learn a little bit more about structure, right? The, the details of what it means to have a loop or setup function and the various other ways you can work with data. Um, so like all of this is not just magic knowledge that I have. This is all just from a reference. So come and explore this site. It's really useful, especially for things like, hmm, I don't remember if the digital write function uh, takes the pin first and the value second or vice versa. Well, if you come to the reference for digital write, 
you come down to the syntax section, it says digital write takes a pin and then a value, easy. And it usually will have example code that shows you a little bit how to use it. So the reference in this case is your friend. All right. So that is the fundamentals of digital output and variables. That's a pretty good place to start. Let's move on to digital input. So uh, to do this, I'm going to wire up another quick circuit. I'll show you here, uh, which looks a lot like our first circuit. So we still have our LED and resistor connected to digital pin two. Um, I should say some, some of you may have noticed um, I'm saying pin D2 here on the Arduino, and then in your code, it's only, you know, pin 2 or pin 13. If you just give a, a number for a pin, it assumes you mean a digital pin. If you want to refer to an analog pin or something specific, then you would say something like A13 or A5. But in this case, pins just take a, a straight up number. Um, so this is the circuit I'm about to wire up. So in addition to our LED on pin 2, I'm going to attach a switch between digital pin 3 and ground. Let's see, there we go. So let's wire this up. Um, while I'm wiring this up, I should say um, we should talk a little about breadboards. So um, because this is a kind of a point of confusion before a lot of people who buy like a getting into Arduino kit and then it comes with this weird plastic thing and you're not quite sure what to do with it. So as I plug that in, um, so this is a breadboard. It's super useful for exactly this kinds of prototyping. Zoom in a little bit here. So you'll see we have uh, these rows of five holes here um, and then a sets of holes down the side. The gist of a breadboard is that you have these five holes in each individual row are connected to each other and have the same kind of springy contacts in them that the Arduino itself has. Um, so you're meant to take a bit of wire and push it down into that hole and it will stay. <laughs> And it will make a solid electrical connection to all the other five pins in this row. It typically will not connect to the five pins that are across from it. Um, this is meant so you can attach a, a computer chip that has two sets of pins across that gap and they won't be connected to each other. Um, similarly, mine has, although not all of them do, these sets of holes down the side here um, by this blue and this red line. All of the blue on this side are connected to each other, so blue, 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 and all the red on this side are connected to each other. And similarly, the blue on this side and the blue and red side. The blue and blue are not typically connected to each other, but you could obviously you know, take a bit of wire and make them connected. Um, so super useful for things like this, right? I need to sort of, for an evening, connect an LED and a resistor and some wire. I'm not gonna solder everything together or butt splice it together, it's just a waste, especially if I might get something wrong or have to change something. So a breadboard is your friend in this case. Um, ones like this on Amazon are, you know, eight bucks for a two pack. You can also get these little tiny ones that don't have those those rails along the side for power and ground. Um, these are dirt cheap. I think I got a five pack of these for three or four bucks and they, they're adhesive on the back. So you can stick them to things if you really want to. Um, so a, a tool worth having. Do you tend to put pull down resistors on your buttons or switches or do it virtually? Ah, Brian's a little bit ahead of me. Yes. Um, we're going to look a little bit at pull ups and pull downs just here in a second. So in this case, now that we have our switch wired into D3, I am going to come back to our blink sketch and I'm going to modify it. Um, oh, let's see. I think actually, I think I wrote some code for this a little bit earlier. That'll speed things up a little bit. Yeah. Excellent. So here's an, we're over here now. <laughs> it's a new piece of code. Um, we'll just walk through it really quickly and then we'll look at what it's doing in the real world, right? So we've declared two variables this time. LED pin is going to be the same. It's going to be digital pin two. Um, so our switch pin is going to be pin three, um, digital pin three, which I just wired into. We're going to configure the LED pin as an output like we did before. And we're going to configure the switch pin as this mode called input pull up. And this goes to the question that Brian was asking. Um, we talked a little bit about this on the stream last week, which was a little bit less focused. Um, but the gist of it is you always want, if you're using a, a pin on an Arduino as an input, you want it to have a definitive voltage value at all times. Um, you don't want it to ever be ambiguous. And I can actually quantify that for y'all a little bit here. So when we talk about an input being high or low, um, you know, much like we said, output is high is five volts, ground uh, low is, you know, zero volts. 
input similarly. Typically, high means 5 volts and low means 0 volts. But on the input side of things, because nothing is perfect in the real world, we have a little bit of flexibility. And so from the data sheet of the Arduino, anything in this 3 to 5 volt range will, when you read its value as a digital value in the Arduino, will come back as high and anything under one and a half volts will come back as low. So you really only have to avoid this one and a half to three volt range in the middle um, where things are a little, you're, you're kind of on the cusp of some of the internal circuitry and it's not entirely clear. Um, but this amount of slop is really great because it means you know your high input doesn't have to be exactly five volts. It can be 4.8 volts because we put a long wire in between and the voltage has dropped a little and similarly like your grounds if they're not exactly at the same potential maybe your low value is 0.1 volts well it's fine anything less than 0.5 volts uh, is acceptable um, as a point of fact there's actually a bit of slop on the output side too right you're only guaranteed to have 4.2 volts as your high voltage and only as low as 0.9 volts as your low voltage in practice that doesn't really happen right you can you can for pretty much all intents and purposes think of low as zero and high as five right so when we're doing an input, what the Arduino is going to look for on this side is say, um, is the voltage that's appearing on this pin, on this point of connection, uh, between 3 and 5 volts? If so, return high. If it's between 0 and 1.5 volts, return low. Um, and if it's in the middle, you don't know what you're going to get. Uh, so stay out of it with your circuit. Right? So coming back over here, I've got my switch wired into ground and digital pin 3. And if I come back over to our code, we'll see what we do with them, right? LED pin is on, LED is on pin two, switch is on pin three, LED pin is an output, switch pin uh, is an input with a pull-up. Ah, right, we started this talking about pull-ups. Um, so a pull-up resistor basically uh, puts a high value resistor uh, between five volts and the pin in question for you internally to the Arduino, like a 10K or a 100K resistor. You can look in the data sheet if it really ever matters. It basically always gently pulls that pin toward five volts. Gen that's a really hand wavy definition, but that's essentially what's happening, right? It gently pulls that voltage up. It says if nothing else is happening, if I have no switches on me or loads or LEDs, I'm going to be at five volts, right? If I just read that value, it's always going to be at five volts. It's always going to be high. Um, but it's doing so so gently that if you put a switch, say, to ground and close it or a wire to ground, it's easy to pull that pin to ground to zero um, and to be able to read those values. That pull up is just there to make sure that if if nothing is connected or if that switch is open, that that value is is consistent and not floating, if that sort of makes sense. That's a hand wavy explanation, but input pull up is your friend and it lets you it lets you wire switches between the Arduino and ground with no additional hardware, which is really easy to use. So let's look at the uh, loop code for this example before we run it. Um, we're defining a new variable called pin value. Um, ooh, good questions from Chris and Megan above before we dive in. Let's see. Chris says, do comments factor into available storage if there's a really large program to you leave comments out? No. Here, come back over here. No, you don't have to. <laughs> um, the comments are filtered out by the code editor, by the compiler, before they're ever put into the Arduino. So comments don't make any difference at all to your code size. Really good question. Megan says, what's the cleanest way to program if you want both lights to flash at the same time? I'm assuming the function only takes one input at a time. Ah, great question. Couple of different ways you could do it. Um, but let's go back over to Blink and I'll show you. Um, so, right, just to go back a second, here's our Blink sketch, digital right, LED pin high, delay, LED pin low, right? If you want them to black to, um, to flash synchronously, you could add an additional digital right command in between your existing digital right command and your delay, right? So if we upload that, and I haven't broken any of the circuitry in the meantime, which I don't think I have. Let's see. Or maybe I have. It wouldn't be the first time. Uh, oh, I should read if I should make sure my LED pin is configured correctly. There we go. Yeah, so now, let's see. LED pin is 2. Oh, and I, ah, so here's a good example, right? It doesn't, the, the coding program doesn't protect you from typos. I put LED pin here twice. It was happy to make that pin low twice. But that's not, of course, what I wanted to do. Now we come back over here, and you can tell, ah, here's another gotcha, right? So the this pin is flashing. This pin you probably can't see on the camera, but it's flashing very, very dimly, which is because we didn't 
configure it as an output. By default, all the pins are inputs. Uh, so we'll do 13 output. And we'll upload one more time. And now, we sh there we go. Now we have both pins flashing at the same time. Good question. Excellent question. There's probably cleaner ways to do that. And again, I just threw that number 13 in there for the built-in LED, which is not a great long-term solution. Um, if you are using a number in more than one place, maybe even if you're using a number in only one place, it's often a good idea to replace it with a variable because um, that will be more descriptive than using a plain number. Cool, good question. Um, jumping back to our switch example, and uh, let's just remind ourselves what that circuit looks like. Right? LED, I'm over here. LED and resistor, switch on pin three, right? So... Uh, the loop code, because what, so what I'm going to want to do is when the switch is closed, I want the LED to turn on. And when the switch is open, I want the, L, uh, the LED to turn off. I actually have that backwards. When a switch is open, I want the LED to turn on. You know, switch, LED, switch, LED, right? So in my loop code here, I'm defining a variable inside of my loop, which is totally fine. I'm going to call it pin value. I'm going to use this digital read function. And the digital read function takes exactly one argument, which is a digital pin. Um, once again, you can see we're using this assignment operator, this equal operator to say, hey, take whatever we're getting out of here, right? The value that we're reading from this switch pin and stuff it into this variable that I'm calling pin value, right? And then the next line, I'm going to say, I'm going to write out to the LED pin, whatever I slurped in from the pin value, right? And I know that because I'm doing a digital read here and a digital write here, that I'm really only dealing with low and high. Using this as an int, right? An int is an integer. So like, is high five? Is high 100? Uh, this doesn't, it's un kind of unclear. And it doesn't actually matter because, you know, since I'm working in, in digital readings here, if it's low, I know it's zero and anything else is high. So it's fine to use an int for the value of a digital read. I'm gonna write that out to the LED pin, right? So now if I upload that code, and I haven't borked anything with my wiring, we can see, yeah, there we go. We can see, so I've got my LED lit here. Hopefully this works. Yeah, there we go. So what's happening is when I change the position of the switch, the LED is turning on and off. Piece of cake. Yeah, I, I think that's that's it for that demo, right? It's uh, It's showing how you can control one thing with a switch. Now, the nice thing is now we have the value of this switch stored in a variable. So we don't have to immediately use it to do this, this digital write. We could do other things in the middle here. And then later on, this, this pin value will still be held and we can digital write it there, right? So variables don't have to be immediately read and then used. You can, uh, you can use them later on in your code. I should also say it would be perfectly valid to um, combine some of these functions into the same place. So I'm going to take this digital read that I'm doing here, and I'm going to put it in place of that variable, right? So what's happening here? So with uh, with nested functions, right? Functions within functions within functions, you work like German from the inside out. I'm not sure if that's how German works. I don't speak German, but I think so. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna take this digital read, we're gonna read the value of this switch pin, then we're going to, it'll be high or low. Then we're going to use that as the high or low value to write out to our LED pin. So assuming I haven't screwed anything up, this should work exactly the same as the previous demo. There you go. So you can decide for yourself for specific situations which of these two things is cleaner, right? In the first example, we had a variable that we could work with called pin value. In the second one, we didn't. Um, like, you know, we have now completely eliminated pin value from our sketch. If this was the only place that I was going to use this digital reading, this might be how I do it. Like, it's pretty easy to read through this line and see what it's doing. Um, but functions can nest in many different ways, and you might have layers and layers and layers of nested values, right? You might take a uh, an input from the internet, and then you might change that into a different form, uh, and then convert it into ASCII, and then divide it by two, uh, multiply it by six, and do all, you, you can put this all in one line if you want to, but often it's more readable if you can break things up. Um, but, you know, it, it's all a matter of style. They will all run and will all work. So it's really up to you what you want to do with your code. Cool. So that's the basics of digital inputs. So we have digital inputs and digital outputs. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about how we hook them together um, with conditional logic, right? Because we, we started the night by saying, 
that um, you know, a computer is going to take some inputs, do some thinking, and produce some outputs. And right now, our thinking is pretty basic, right? It's literally, we, we're, not, we're not having any control over how it's doing that thinking. Um, it's just running setup once and then it's looping forever, right? And that's not super interesting. Um, so um, we're going to introduce a new structure um, called if-then-else, which you may have run across before. Um, and it's going to work like this. I'm going to write some code that says I only want the LED pin to be on, or the LED to be on, if uh, both this switch is turned on and, you, you might have noticed, I have a sneaky little button hiding down here. Excuse me. Um, and I want uh, the LED to be on only when these two things are activated, right? There doesn't seem like there's quite a way to do that with the code that we know already, right? We're combining these two things together in a way. Um, so let's see how to do that. So back over in our code, um, I'm going to define another variable. I'm going to call it my button pin. I'm going to call it pin 4. I mean, it could be any pin we want, but I like pin 4. Um, and it matches the drawings I made earlier, which we'll see in a sec. Um, like before, I'm going to do a pin mode command, which says the button pin is another of this input pull-up type. Um, and that's going to let me wire it in much like the switch, right? So here's our full circuit. I have D2 uh, has a resistor and an LED on it, D3 has this switch to ground, and D4 ha now will have this button to ground as well, right? Um, and real quick, let's just make sure that's wired in. So you can start to see the advantage of using a breadboard for something like this, because I have the ground from the Arduino tied into this big blue bus over here, this big blue combination of things that are tied together. And so I can just use this little tiny orange wire to connect ground to one side of this button, and then I can connect the other side of this button to pin four, right? So that's, that's our circuit as we're as drawn. Um, so let's come over back to our code and make it so that uh, the LED is only lit, uh, I think because of the way this button, well, let's, no, let's make it so that it's only lit when the switch is switched on and the button is being pressed, right? So I'm gonna delete some of the code we wrote before. Uh, and I'm going to write our first, I'm um, over here, our first uh, if then statement. And it looks something like this. Um, if, right, and you can tell we've we've done something that the code editor knows about because it's color coded it for us, right? If you spell it wrong, it goes back to black because it, it doesn't know what you're talking about. If I say if, um, I enclose the next part in parentheses, I say if, and I open, oh, uh, let's see. Yes. I'm sorry, I have a little brain fart moment here. So this is the structure of an if then else command. And in the middle here, inside these parentheses, is going to be our conditional statement. And basically this way it works is this. Um, if whatever value I put inside of these parentheses is true, and we'll see how we get to true in just a second here. If, if that is the case, then do the code inside this pair of curly brackets. If it is not true, do the code that's inside of this else bracket. So if something, do this thing. Otherwise, do this other thing. You don't have to have this else bracket, right? It's just there as an addendum, right? You can certainly leave it off if you're just doing a single conditional. You know, if this is true, do something. And in this case, if that is not true, well, we just go on to the rest of the code, right? You don't have to have an else block. Um, so here's what we're going to put inside of our else block. First, let's define a couple of variables. We'll call our switch value. We'll do a digital read on the switch pin, right? This, this syntax should look familiar, right? I'm defining a, an integer variable called switch value um, that's going to take, going to be assigned the value that I'm reading from the pin that the switch is connected to. And I'm going to define a uh, variable called button value, which will be a digital read from the button pin, right? This, this is basically what we did before with the, with the switch. Now we're going to do it with the button as well. So now I have these two values. Uh, and let's say uh, I was going to do with conditional logic, I wanted to say um, turn on the LED will be what we do in our if block. And if that condition is not met, I would like to turn off the LED. Well, we know how to turn the LED on and off right? We've done that before. It's a digital write to the LED pin, turning it high. 
Uh, and we know how to turn the LED off. We did that before. We want a digital right to the LED, the LED pin low. This is actually, a, my typo there is a really good chance to highlight. Variable names are case specific. So LED pin, all lowercase, is not the same as LED pin, all capitalized, is not the same as LED pin in camel case, right, where things alternate. Um, so there's lots of different conventions for whether you should capitalize or not, and in what cases. As long as you're consistent with yourself, you won't end up in a situation where, you know, LED pin is all lowercase except in one place in the middle of a thousand lines of code that you're tearing your hair out because you can't find, right? So anyway, that's a tangent. Uh, so this is what our function should do, right? If something, turn the pin on, else turn the pin off. And here's what we'll do for that something. Um, I'm going to use a new operator that we haven't seen before that is the comparison operator. Uh, and that is this double equal sign. So the double equal sign says, uh, compare what's on my left and what's on my right. If they are equal to each other, uh, and give off a value that is true. We're gonna return true. Um, if uh, if they are not equal to each other, make it false, right? So this is basically saying like, if the switch value is high in a way, do this, else, uh, or if it's not, turn the LED off. Let's actually, let's upload just this code because this will actually should do exactly what our previous code did, right? If the switch is activated, it'll turn the LED on. If the switch is not activated, turn it off. Ah, I have a typo. This is what a typo looks like. It says button was not declared in this scope. It means uh, you said the word button and you've never told me about button before. I don't know what you're talking about because of course what I meant was button pin, right? Uploading, come back over here. We'll see if I goofed anything up. Yeah, there we go. So this code is the same as it was before, right? When the switch is active, the LED is on. When the switch is inactive, the LED is off, right? So let's add in one more bit of functionality where we evaluate whether both of these switches are activated. And I'm gonna use one more operator for tonight, which is the logical and operator, which is this, it's two ampersands. Um, and it basically says, um, this whole thing on either side of my double ampersands is true if and only if both sides of it are true. It's a logical and, if you think back to your, your logic class you may have taken. Um, so on this side of the logical and, I'm going to say button value uh, is compared to high, right? So looking at this line in total, it says, if my switch value has, if my switch value here has the value of high and my button value has the value of high, turn the LED on, else turn the LED off, right? Let's upload that. We'll see if I've goofed up. We haven't tested the wiring for the button yet, so there might also be a physical error, but we'll see, right? So now, ah, uh-huh. So right now, I'm not pressing the button and the LED is still turning on, but I suspect, yeah, so I have my truth values inverted, right? What is happening now is I can only turn on the LED if the switch is on and the button is not pressed, right? Which is not the functionality that I want, but it just means this button is working in a slightly different way than I thought it was. There's a couple ways we can fix that. Um, we could do a couple things. The most obvious one to me is say, well, really then I want this to be true when that button value is low, right? Instead of high, we'll sort of invert it that way. Um, but there's another way that we could do this. We can use another logical operator, which is the not equal to operator, right? This operator, the comparison operator says, you know, uh, this is true if both sides are equal. This operator, the uh, exclamation point equals is the not equals operator um, that says, uh, return true if these two things are not equal. So if we upload that, come back over here, there we go. So now, yeah, it doesn't matter what position the switch is in, things won't turn on, but if I turn the switch on and press the button, LED turns on, right? And if I keep the button pressed but I turn the switch off, doesn't matter what the button does, right? So then you can sort of start to see how we're stringing together uh, in a logical way, various inputs to produce certain outputs, which is, you know, this is sort of the very beginnings of how we're talking about doing this thinking inside of the Arduino is with some of this conditional logic. Yeah? Cool. So that's, that's, that's the very big basics of if an if then else statement. Um, I am a little bit parched, so I'm going to take a second and drink some of my tasty Cosmo Pale Ale from Dune Whistle <laughs> um, and open it up for more questions. Um, actually, I can see, let's see. Oh, uh, keep keep the questions coming. I'm gonna throw something out that Kenneth put in the chat a little bit ago. Um, 
We're talking about the digital write function happening really fast. So the uh, Arduino runs on a chip called the Atmega 328 that runs at 16 megahertz per second, which means that it does 16 million fundamental operations every second. Did I say megahertz per second? If I did, strike that, reverse it, 16 megahertz. Um, a fundamental operation is not necessarily the same thing as a line of code in our situation. Um, it's, you know, a, a digital write piece of code might actually do two or three things, right? It might have to um, enable that bit for output and then actually make it output and then record that's outputted. So it may take two or three of these clock cycles, these fundamental instructions to make something happen. But when we talk about something um, happening, you know, really quite fast, we're talking millions of these lines can execute per second. Um, so things that are sort of next to each other, for most purposes, can be considered happening, you know, at the same time. Now, when you get to something like DMX, say, or um, RS-485, or the internet, or something that really is operating at megahertz frequencies, you can run into issues, right? If, you're, if your data line is supposed to change every few milliseconds, you don't have a lot of processing time in between each of those changes to make something happen. So there is a speed limit to how fast things can go. And that, just for a little tangent, might be a situation where you'd want to use, an, an easy solution would be to use um, something like an Arduino Mega, um, which has just a, a faster, beefier chip on it, the Atmel, uh, Atmega 2560. Uh, it just runs faster. It gives you more time. I have definitely thrown Arduino Megas at projects before because I, uh, maybe I'm going to run out of speed. Maybe things aren't going to happen fast enough. Um, so you just throw a Mega at it. These things are 10 bucks. Um, off the shelf or less than that if you can wait for the slow boat. Um, so that's a really easy solution if you're ever worried about time. Travis, I do not get free. <laughs> yes, I get free beer in the sense that Mary bought it for me. Uh, my wife bought it for me. Uh, not bought, bought it for me, bought it for us and I'm drinking it. And thank you, Mary, and I appreciate you. And really thanks to Mary for all the troubleshooting she helped me do on this stream. Mm. Palmer says, my goal project is a NeoPixel ClearCom call light that ways to see a call on com, which is a voltage, runs a NeoPixel animation, then goes off and waits for the call button to be pressed again. I keep getting stuck in the loop part. Ah, okay. So you're, you're waiting. <laughs> I'm gonna ignore that kind of. So yeah, so, so Palmer's asking an interesting question. It kind of, I think it harkens back to the question you were asking earlier, Palmer, about how do you write a piece of code um, that basically waits for input and then does something and then waits for input again, right? I think that's the gist of the question here. Um, and since these are all, uh, there are other demos we can do tonight, but this I think is a, a really interesting way to start thinking about program flow. So let's do a little bit of code. Um, so let's see here. Um, let's do a slightly simpler analog to your question here, Palmer, I think, because I have some NeoPixels here somewhere, um, but oh, I'm over here. I'm over here now. Um, here, maybe I'll go back to this and then I can be wherever I want to be. Um, uh, but let's just say, let's, um, let's, uh, let's make this our problem statement, right? I'm going to take the switch out of this circuit here for a second. And I'm going to say, I'm going to write a piece of code that is going to uh, wait for this button to be pressed. Um, and when it is, light up this LED for, uh, well, make this LED flash twice and then turn off and wait for the button to be pressed again, right? That's essentially the analog of your question, I think, right? You're waiting for a voltage to appear and then doing something and then waiting again. Um, so let's see what that code might look like. Let's come back over here to the computer. Um, so let's start again by defining a couple of our variables. We'll keep the names the same. Um, we'll say LED pin is still on two. Um, we'll say our button pin is still pin four because that's where they're hooked up. Um, we will, in fact, we'll do some some really good coding practice here, which is to copy and paste. Copy and paste is your friend. Copy and paste from examples. Copy and paste from this stuff. All you want, right? So my LED pin's going to be an output. My button pin's going to be an input, right? So um, here's there are many ways you could do this, Palmer, but um, one way that I might say, wait for this button to be pressed and then do something is this. Um, first, let's write the do something part of this. Um, and actually, this is a great chance to talk a little bit about functions, which is getting a, maybe a little bit ahead of where the lesson plan would be if I had one, but I don't. So here we go. Um, so you might have noticed this word void in front of setup and loop. Um, and that is part of the process of defining a function. 
uh, which we can do for things that we write ourselves. And I'll explain why that void is there in a second. Um, but uh, for now, I'm gonna write a new function that says void, uh, let's say do something be our name. Um, similarly, I'm gonna put my two uh, parentheses there and we'll explain why in a second. And I'm gonna put my set of curly brackets. The curly brackets basically define a, a chunk of code, right? We had them for this loop function, they define this loop chunk of code. We had them for our if then else statement, they define chunks of code. Um, a really common error, especially when you get really deep into like a layer of code is to, to accidentally delete a set of curly brackets. And so instead of having A inside B inside C inside D, what you have is A uh, leaks into B, uh, leaks into C, uh, leaks into D, right? And you're just missing a, a set of parentheses somewhere. It can cause weird errors. So always worth keeping track of. Um, so let's say in our do something portion of our code polymer, just to make this up, I'm gonna say digital write uh, LED pin high uh, delay 250, let's say a quarter of a second, digital write LED pin low, and delay a quarter of a second. And we said we wanted it to flash twice, so I'm just gonna copy and paste that and do it a second time. There is a cleaner way, I know, um, but don't get ahead of me on the lesson plan. Or do, I mean, put it in the chat, I don't care. There is no lesson plan. It's all, we're, we're through it. Um, so here's how we're gonna use this do something function that we've written. Right? So if I put in my loop here, do something, right? This is now gonna act a lot like any of our built-in functions, right? You can see the, the syntax looks very much the same, right? It's not gonna highlight it for us, um, but uh, much like we said digital write and gave it some parameters, I'm gonna use my do something function. And I, doesn't, I don't need to give it any parameters, right? There's nothing to change about it, but we can change that in a second here, right? So. Now, so now what this is gonna do is define my inputs and then just do something. And when do something is done, it's gonna do something again, and so on and so on. The important part here is when we're doing this do something, you know, we get to this point in our loop, we jump into this function, we do it all the way to completion, then we jump back. And then we're gonna call it again, and do it all the way to completion and then jump back. We can't do anything else at the same time with this version of this code. So I'm gonna upload this. Oh, it's gonna make me save it. I'm gonna call it Palmer Demo. Upload's just fine. And now, if we come back to the table, right, you can see we're flashing on and off every quarter of a second, right? Which is what we wanted it to do. So now, how do we make this wait for this button to be pressed to make that happen? All right, so let's come back over here. Um, and what I would say is um, if, we'll use our, our if then statement, right? So first thing I'm gonna do is just wrap this in curly braces. And it's a good practice when you've got a set of curly braces to indent everything within it. This makes it really easy to see where your blocks of code are lining up. More fancier code editors will do some of this indentation for you, um, but it's good practice to get into for yourself. Um, either with a tab or, well, no, with a tab is the right answer. Some people will do multiple spaces, but the right answer is a tab. Um, so I wanna say if digital read, digital read, uh, button pin, and we said when we press the button, it went low. Uh, oh, sorry, digital pin, uh, digital read button pin only needs one parameter. It's like equal equals low. We'll do something, right? Well, let's upload that. Oops, what did I say? Button pin, ah, okay, here's a good example. Button pin's not supposed to have this capital P in the middle, right? Not declared in this scope is usually code for you mistyped it. Uploading, come back over here to the table. So now, there we go. So now when I press this button, when it sees that the pin has gone low, it's going to do something. It's gonna flash twice uh, and then won't do anything else. So why, this, this is sort of giving you this waiting for something to happen command, but the code isn't waiting. So what's actually happening? Well, all it's doing is we're, right, we're going through this loop code over and over and over again. And all it's doing is say, every time we go through this loop, it says, is the button pin low? Well, no, is the button pin low? No, is the button pin low? No. And it's doing this, you know, millions of times a second until the moment that the button pin is low and then it will do something. Does that sort of make sense? So thinking about things that are happening in response to stimuli are often a matter of waiting, you know, waiting for the initial conditions to be true and then causing it to do something. Does that sort of make sense? So here's here's one of the advantages since we've started um, since we've started talking about functions a little bit, 
Uh, let's see. Just oh, quick question from Justine says: Do you usually use the Arduino's code editor for your more complicated projects, or use Notepad plus plus and copy it into Arduino code editor? Um, I will typically use the. It's a good question. I'll usually use Sublime as my primary text editor. It doesn't have a great tool chain for uploading directly to the Arduino. So often I'll write the big, the bigger chunks of my code in, copy it into the IDE, the Arduino code editor once, um, and then just continue troubleshooting from there. There are better workflows I know out there. Um, Microsoft Visual Studio can be hooked up to an Arduino in a direct way. Um, but for most of my projects, the, the Arduino IDE suffices. Um, I like Sublime because it's easier to do sort of color coding in. Um, I do all my Python coding in Sublime, so I'm just sort of used to the interface. Um, but but I, the Arduino IDE is certainly not the be-all, end-all of features. And if anyone out there has a better workflow or knows about them, feel free to shout it out there. A good question. Um, so talking a little about functions, um, part of the value of encapsulating your code in a function like this is that it makes it really easy to change critical behaviors later on, right? So our code here, our Palmer code that we'll call it, um, is, you know, if the button goes low, do something. Um, now, this is a proxy for Palmer's NeoPixel behavior that he wants, right? He's later gonna have to write some code that um, controls some NeoPixels, and there's a there's some additional bit of code for that. NeoPixels, for those who haven't seen them, are basically little LEDs that have individual drivers in them, so rather than having to hook each one to an individual uh, pin of your Arduino, you can hook them all together in series and you basically send all the data daisy chained through all of them. Um, really handy thing. It takes a fair amount of processing power if you get a lot of LEDs because you have to shove all the data at them, um, but it's a good way to control a lot of LEDs with a, a small amount of outputs. Um, so later on, Palmer's gonna have to uh, you know, change some of this code so it actually controls NeoPixels instead of blinking this LED. Um, now that this is encapsulated in a function, he won't have to worry about what this condition was at all, right? This condition could become horribly complicated, like, you know, it could be uh, based on the button pin, uh, the time of day, the humidity, um, whether the dead man switch is active, all these various things. Like, this could be a very complicated bit of code. But Palmer just knows that he only wants to affect the results, so he'll only have to edit this do something function once, right? The other value of encapsulating things inside functions um, is you can uh, call them more than once or in more than one place, right? So currently I'm having this LED flash twice uh, in this do something function. I could just as easily delete half my code and call it twice, right? So if we upload that back to the table, it should do exactly the same thing, right? So it's doing something, which is one flash, and then doing it again. Right, so this is this is one of the ways that we can uh, we can reuse functions to make our lives a little bit easier. Um, since we're kind of down the function rabbit hole, which is not quite where I thought we would go tonight, but I think it's it's actually quite a good place to be. Let's talk just a little bit about function parameters, right? So when we were working with um, digital write earlier, where's my digital write? Yeah, so digital write is itself a function. It takes two parameters, right? The pin you want to affect and the level you want to put that pin at, right? we, with our functions that we're writing ourselves, can invent our own parameters. Um, in this case, and we, we can call them really whatever we want, um, uh, I'm going to call my parameter the Palmer delay. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to call it the flash delay. Um, and this is the syntax for that, right? So this function takes an integer called flash delay. And once I've named it in my function declaration, which is what this is called, right? I'm declaring that do something is a function, I can use this value of flash delay inside of my function. So in this case, I'm going to replace uh, my 250 milliseconds here with flash delay, right? So now if I try and compile this, it should throw me an error. Yes, there's too few arguments to function do something, right? Because up here, I've just called the function do something and I haven't told it what this flash delay is. In C++, in Arduino, if you have a parameter in your function, you must provide uh, you must provide that value when you call that function. I'm not sure if you've used that terminology yet, but when you use a function in your code, it's called calling that function. It's saying, hey, uh, I'm running through my code and oh, I see this label do something. I'm calling out to this function do something to execute its code now, right? 
So because do something now takes this parameter flash delay, I have to provide it. And in this case, why don't I say 250 and 250, right? So once again, we've just done the same thing in a different way. Come back over here, press the button, same thing, two flashes. We're just doing the same thing in different ways at this point. Um, but the value of doing it with parameters is they don't have to be the same thing every time. So let's say uh, for the first run of do something, I want to delay for a thousand milliseconds. And for the second run, I want to delay for 200 milliseconds, right? So we're going to upload that code. And so what this will do is uh, the first time I get here, right, when the button pin goes low, I'm going to do something with a flash delay of a thousand milliseconds. We're going to jump into this code where flash delay is a thousand, right? Set the pin high, delay for a thousand milliseconds, set it low, delay for a thousand milliseconds, right? So now we're done. We jump back to where we started, right? We said, oh, we're done with that code. What's next? Oh, do something with a flash delay of 200 milliseconds. So we jump down to this code again, except now flash delay is 200, right? So uh, now we delay for 200 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds. That sort of makes sense, right? This is a way of injecting a value into our function, more or less, via a parameter. So I'm not sure if, I, uh, if I've compiled that yet, but I think I have. So now let's come back over to the table. And you'll see when I press this button, I get one long flash and one short flash. Yeah, there we go. Let's see some comments here. From Kenneth talking about code editing. Uh, blink up Morse code. You certainly could. Um, there are people who've already figured out how to do Morse code in Arduino, um, which you could steal their code or just download it for yourself. Um, but that would certainly be, that certainly is, it's really, there's an amazing piece of code um, called, uh, I'm going to forget it. I'll put it in the comments. Um, that is like a really good Morse code sender and decoder all in Arduino. It's really cool. Chris says, can you inject multiple variables? Yes, Chris. You can. What a good question. I love this crowd. Um, I'll show you how to do it over here. Um, so the way you would do that is like this. So um, what is a, another parameter we could use? We could tell it, um, uh, let's see. Ooh, let's not to learn two lessons at once. Let's call it, um, we'll call it the output pin. Ooh, and I'm, I should be more consistent. You see, I'm kind of mixing my cases here, but my variables are lowercase. I've capitalized do something. I'm not being super duper consistent here, but for the sake of this demo, I think we'll be okay. So we'll take another parameter here. We'll call it output pin. It'll be another integer. And rather than always flashing the LED pin I defined earlier, I will give myself the opportunity to pick which pin at the time that I call do something, right? So this is now going to flash whatever pin I tell it to for and delay for however long I tell it to, right? So I'm gonna come back up here to our invocations, our calls to do something, and now I have to give them a pin. So that pin could be a literal number or it could be a variable like LED pin, right? So once again, changing code to do the same thing. Come back to the table. Yep, we're compiling, we're uploading. A um, little thing I don't think you may have seen yet, um, you can tell if your code is uploading. Let's reach over here. You'll see the little transmission lights flash, flash. And when they're done, you know you're done uploading, right? Little tiny thing. Um, so now, right, I flash my LED pin on for a long time and a short time. Um, but I could just as easily change uh, the, oop, come back over here. There we go. Um, change the uh, pin on this first one here to our LED built-in value that we had earlier. And we'll upload that, right? So come back over here to the table. And now I'm going to shield this so you can see the light a little bit better. Oh, haha. I don't think I declared. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm going to declare my LED uh, built in output, right? Because pins default to being inputs. Um, the reason that pins default to being inputs is inputs are sort of a protected state. They're, they, you know, say I'm not going to make a... Uh, accept too many changes from the outside world because I want to see what's changing in the outside world. So if you're going to make a pin an output, you have to do it explicitly like this, right? So coming back over to the table, now when we run this, I press the button, we should see built-in LED stays on for a second and then a short flash on the LED pin, right? So now so that's a way you can use multiple variables to define the behavior of your code. The order does matter. So 
right in my function definition here, I said that flash delay comes first and the output pin comes second, right? So when I'm calling that function, the flash delay has to come first and the output pin comes second, right? If you flip them around, it may still work, right? For example, if I was doing, um, right, LED built-in uh, is, is, is just 13, right? And my output pin uh, could be, I don't know, let's say we were only wanted things to be on for two milliseconds anyway, right? This will still compile, right? The compiler doesn't stop you from making typos. It just may not do what you want. I don't think we're actually gonna see this, yeah. So that, that first one delays for two milliseconds. It doesn't actually do anything. Um, but that's sort of a, you know, watch out for typos and watch out for transpositions in that way. So we come back over here. Oh, we're, we're still over here. All right, well, great. Um, and we'll undo things. Um, I think, so let's, let's do, I know we're getting right on that tight 90 that I said we would, uh, that we said we would stop at, but I think I want to do one more thing. Um, since we've sort of gotten into this idea of um, doing something multiple times, I want to just gently introduce the idea of loops um, and how you might build in a way to do something multiple times that's not just calling the do something function multiple, multiple times. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can loop through something, but the one I want to start with is something called a for loop. So coming back over to code. All right, we're going to leave our do something function alone. Um, let's see. Um, let us, let's see, since, uh, since Chris Wick provided the inspiration for doing multiple things at once, we're going to call this, uh, we're calling this do wick loop. We'll make a new function. Um, I should say, so you can see, like, there is really not much limitation on what you can call your variables or your functions. There are a few. There is a maximum length in characters that you can call your function names. 63 characters? 127 characters? Kenneth might know in the chat. Um, you also, you have to start with a letter, right? You can't call your function, you know, 10 do wick loop. Um, you can include underscores in the middle if you want to. Um, and you have to, you have to start with a letter. You can't start with like a punctuation or a slash, but basically, um, any contiguous series of letters up to a certain length is valid. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to call it do wick loop. We can come up with a better name for that. This is how you get to that point where like at the beginning, it's fun and cute and you know what it means. It's like, uh, do X. Uh, but then your code basically comes thousands of lines long and you're like, oh, I wish I had to call this something more evocative. Um, we're going to call this something flash multiple times. Um, and it's going to take a parameter, call it int, uh, times to flash. I like to make my variable names pretty verbose, um, just especially for a straightforward example like this, because it's an easier way to remember what you're doing. Um, so we're going to, as we love to do, copy and paste. Let's see. Actually, we don't even have to. We're going to, we don't even have to copy and paste. We can reuse the function that we wrote earlier, right? So... Um, flash multiple times is going to take the same parameters as do something, right? It's going to take uh, a flash delay, it's going to take an output pin, and it's going to take uh, a new parameter called times to flash. So now what I'm going to do is basically I want every time that I call flash multiple times, I want to call do something that number of times, right? But I can't just be in here copying and pasting like in real time every time I call this function, right? So how do we repeat this naturally? Um, and we'll use something called, I think I mentioned it, a for loop. The for loop syntax uh, looks something like this. It starts with for, it has parentheses, and it has some curly brackets like so many blocks of code do. We're going to indent to make it really easy to see what's inside of it. And what goes in the parentheses is this. Um, something like, I'm going to type it all out and then I'll explain it. Int i equals zero i is less than times to flash semicolon i plus plus okay there's a lot going on there so let's break it down so you can tell because there are three i don't think you can get last semicolon there's two semicolons in here we actually have three different statements inside this block of parentheses and here's what they are this int i thing we know what that is right that's declaring a variable called i it's sort of tradition in a for loop to use short variable names i, I is really typical usually if you have multiple you say i j k right because you're going to be referring to this value a lot and it's just going to typically count up um, so using a short little variable name is really handy right we're going to start it off as zero um, then 
uh, every time we run through this loop and get to the end, we're going to do whatever we say we do in the third command. I++ plus plus is shorthand for add one to I. Um, you could say I equals I plus one. Um, but we have, because, because so often when we're incrementing through things, when we're stepping through multiple times, we just want to add one to something. We have the shorthand, which is just I plus plus. Um, when do we know when to stop? Well, we'll stop when the value, when this secondary, uh, evaluation is true. And much like before, um, or when, we'll, we'll keep doing this while this middle value is true, I should say, right? So before we had our comparison operator, you remember we had our, our equal equals operator, right? That was, that was comparing two things together and making sure that they were equal and true. Um, similarly, we have this less than operator, which is true if, in this case, i is less than times to flash. You've got all kinds of, all the other ones are there too. If you go look in the reference, you have greater than, you have less than or equal to, and so on. Um, uh, we had not equals, right? You have your sort of standard mathematical comparisons. Let's see, Kenneth chimed in, as I thought he might, on um, variable names and function names. Language doesn't limit you. Don't make your function names longer than 256 characters. Yeah, that's a that's a good call. Longer than about like 20 characters gets a little bit um, a little bit overwhelming. Okay, it also makes the point. Yeah, so these function names are just for our convenience as coders. The com the compiler is not going to shove flash multiple times the name into your code. It's going to make that a symbol and put that in your or a place in memory, really, and put that into your code. So make it as long as you feel like, um, but don't make it too long or you'll go a little bit crazy. Um, this is also why if you were to take the code, if you could take the code back out of an Arduino, which there's not, there's not a straightforward way to do it that, but it can be done. You don't recover function names. You just recover these snippets in memory. Um, so you get asked a lot about like, hey, I had this Arduino, can you get the code off of it? The answer is I, yes, it's not particularly easy and you don't recover function names. So a lot of these things come out kind of being a little bit unintelligible um, because you don't have the descriptive names or the comments to go along them. You just have the raw structure, if that makes sense. Um, okay, let's finish up our, our flash multiple times example. So uh, flash multiple times, right? A function that takes three parameters, flash delay, output pin, and times to flash. Um, when it does, it's basically going to, uh, this, the number of times indicated by times to flash, it's going to do something and do something takes our same flash delay and output pin. And you'll notice I'm sharing these variable names here for convenience with the ones that are declared in do something, but they don't have to be like, this could be, um, we could call this beans and we could call this, um, lettuce. Right? And this would work exactly the same way, right? These names are purely descriptive. They're there for your convenience. Um, now, if I were to save this and come back in a week and be like, why, what, what does, what is beans? What is lettuce? What am I doing? I'd be really mad at myself. So I'm going to leave them as description names, flash delay and output pin. Um, so let's come back up here to our code and we will say, uh, if digital read button pin low, we will flash multiple times. Uh, we will do that with flash delay, uh, let's say 250 quarter of a second. The output pin will be our LED pin and we'll do it five times. Um, I should say part of, I'm over here, yes. So this is a, 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 a decent way of going about doing things for the sake of like explaining them. If I was writing this code um, for an application, I would probably be compiling this and running it to my Arduino in, in much more frequently and in, in smaller chunks to sort of verify at each step of the way, it's sort of like we've been doing, that everything is working how we should, because it sucks to, you know, write uh, this function, that call this function and that function, this function, and then run it and it doesn't work. And it's not always obvious which steps of those chain are broken, if that sort of makes sense. Um, but let's upload this and see if I've messed anything up. I have no typos, that's a good sign. We'll come back over to the table and I'll say, when I press this button, we should get five flashes if we're lucky. One, two, three, four, five. Hey, that's awesome. Um, so now we can change, uh, that we can now change the number of times that it flashes just by changing our code, right? I could say, you know, this is all going back to Palmer's example of, I want a call button that flashes at me when something changes on a, a voltage. And it's like, now it's flashing kind of slow and maybe not enough times. Maybe it wants to flash seven times with a delay of 150 milliseconds. We'll upload that, come back to the table. 
right? And now when I press the button, we get more flashes, right? Um, so now we're starting to see how we can, so we can sort of wrap basic functions in, basic uh, operations in a small function, and then we can uh, use larger functions to sort of expand on the possibilities or expand on the functionality of those functions, I guess is the word that I'm looking for. So uh, the for loop is a super useful loop um, that you can use to basically do something multiple times. Um, you don't have to necessarily um, step through it uh, one unit at a time, right? This I plus plus could be, you know, I equals I plus two, and you could step through it by twos and would only run half as many times. That's probably not what you want, but you, it would certainly run. In fact, we can run it. Um, we'll come back over here to the table. And now, so here, let's just be clear about what we're doing, right? So I'm calling this with a value of flash seven, flash delay will be, or flash times to flash is seven, right? So when I jump into this code, um, I'm gonna start with i is zero, and I'm gonna run as long as i is less than times to flash increment by two each time. So we'll start with zero, two, four, six. So if I'm counting right, we should see four flashes. All right, so press the button. One, two, three, four. There we go. So it's very functional. Um, it's pr it's not particularly useful in this case, but just to show you that like you don't have to step through by ones. There may be some situations in which it makes more sense to count down as opposed to up. Um, there might be some situations where you're using that counting variable to um, reference a position in a list of data, right? Let's say I want to step through a list of information by threes that I could count up by threes, right? So as long as you're following this basic, you know, initialize variable, our condition uh, when to continue and this um, incrementing step or decrementing step or jumping step, you can mess with this to your heart's content. Let's see some questions. How can you interrupt the loop? Button pressed, flashing loop 30 times, button pressed again while flashing starts the counter over and goes to flashing 30 times. Ah, yes, good question, Chris. Palmer's, ooh, here we are. Palmer's question, um, does order matter? Could the do something question be written after the flash multiple times question and work the same? Um, so to answer Palmer's question first, no, order doesn't matter. Um, you can in fact, let me jump back over here. Let's, I'll just show you. Um, I can put flash multiple times above the other code. I can upload it come back to the table and run it works just the same right the compiler is going to I, or the compiler the linker the, the code the, the program on my computer that's taking what I've written in basically English and turning it into instructions that the computer that the Arduino can understand um, is going to process all of the code once and look for all of these names and functions and declarations and then do its processing so no order does not matter you can put the functions uh, it, in Arduino code, it's sort of traditional to put setup and loop first because everyone knows that you're looking for them and then other functions after that. Um, but you don't have to. They can kind of be anywhere. Um, to go to Chris's question, how to interrupt the loop, button pressed equals flashing the loop 30 times. Button pressed again while flashing starts counter over and goes to flashing 30. Yeah, Chris, this is a really excellent question. Um, and... I don't think it's too advanced to get into tonight. It might might be our final our final question of the night, because um, I we've we're now we we've like we we started on time but we've run over time a little bit. I mean I'm I'm having a delightful time. I just uh, I don't want to burn anybody out on this stuff. Um, but one of the things that your question gets to Chris is that while we're in the middle of this delay function here, right, which is just waiting around for a bunch of milliseconds. We are literally not doing anything else. It's just, it's literally just a delay. The computer basically, the Arduino goes to sleep and does nothing. Um, which in a situation like you're describing, right, where we want to be listening for inputs, is not necessarily the one we want to do. Uh, not, we mostly we want it to sort of be listening and active, or we might be wanting to do something, something else at the same time. It might be right. Um, when I press the button, flash the light uh, a certain number of times that I want to pick at the times to flash. Um, but I also want to keep this, uh, let's say this servo motor rocking back and forth. And to do that, I have to be continually writing it commands. There are a couple of different strategies for implementing code like this. Um, one of which is interrupts um, and one of which is doing your own sort of um, real time processing. The interrupt code, I will totally admit, I'm not quite prepared to share tonight, but let me share with you um, a sort of 
Ugh, multi-threading is such an abuse of the term um, to, to do it. Um, but ways you can have multiple things happening uh, at the same time without relying on delay. This is a point that I actually see a lot of people get sort of, they sort of catch on, right? Where you're like, I want to do two things at once, but my, my regularly happening thing has this delay function in it. And while delay is happening, nothing else can happen. What do I do? Um, and uh, the... I think we will probably bring this out into a separate video because I want to explain it right and I, I'm not 100% sure I will get it right on the first time through here. Um, but to, to give you a little sketch of something you might do um, is, I wonder if actually if I have any code that would show this off. I wish I had some, I don't know if Lee and Travis are still here. We did a haunted house project together right when I was out of undergrad that um, we did all kinds of things, but one of the things we did was um, automate a CTA car, a fake CTA car that had hydraulics underneath it and a bunch of LED tape and lighting inside of it. And at the press of a button or a switch by the operator, uh, multiple things would happen in sequence. Lights would flash more or less randomly like you were going by in a train track, hydraulics would actuate, and then after a certain amount of time, uh, the sort of state would change. Um, and the car would break down and crash and the lights would go out and you'd open up the back emergency exit of the train car and you would be uh, in the haunted house. That's how you got to the haunted zombie wasteland that the haunted house took place in. It was really, really cool um, and had a lot of this sort of multi-processing, multi-threading process that we went into it with, right? So it's a little bit of a tease because I don't think we're going to get into that tonight, but it, it does sort of bring me to one more thing we could talk about, um, which is time. Um, uh, it's like <laughs> Travis is still here. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I, speaking of second video, before we dive into time, um, I'm thinking probably every Sunday night I'll be here. Um, and all of these are, all these streams are, will be on YouTube at this exact same link or on my channel. Um, so if you miss one, they'll certainly still be here. Um, but I think every Sunday night is probably good. Does that seem, I don't know, I, I'm doing this for fun. I'll probably be here every Sunday night. If you guys want to come and hang out, I would love it. Um, and also, I hope you, those of you who have not played with this stuff before, I hope you get a chance to. Um, and come back with questions, and we'll see what we want to talk about next time. Oh, that's so good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about time uh, in the Arduino land. So um, the, the Arduino itself uh, has an internal variable. Oh, we're over here. The Arduino, the Arduino itself has an internal variable um, that keeps track of the uh, number of milliseconds that have elapsed since your code started running. Um, and that can be a really useful way to keep track of how much time has elapsed in your code at any given point. And I'll, I'll show you an example. So here's a blank bit of code. Uh, we'll just call this time demo. We'll just save that real quick. Boop. Um, and here, let's just make this even bigger. Um, I'm going to declare a new variable to hold the value of my time in. Um, and in this case, so uh, we're counting in milliseconds, right? So it goes by a thousand every second. And I think I mentioned earlier that an integer uh, will only hold up to 2 to the 16th value. So uh, the maximum value of an integer, let's say current time, uh, would be something like 65, 536, I don't know. I think that's right. Um, which is only 65 seconds, right? When you're talking about a thousand milliseconds for every second, uh, this is not gonna count up for very long. So if your program runs for more than 65 and a half seconds, this number is going to loop back around to zero. And uh, suddenly your program was like, well, I saw I was at 64 seconds a moment ago, and now I'm at zero seconds. And that might not do the thing that you want it to do, right? So in this case, for storing values of time, we'll see why in a second, I'm gonna use this other kind of variable called long. A long integer is two to the 32 uh, is its maximum value or about 2.1 billion um, or about 2.1 million milliseconds, uh, right? Because we have a thousand of them taken up every second, right? So whenever you're working with these values of milliseconds, you wanna use a long integer, right? And I'm gonna do a new thing that we haven't seen before. I'm gonna declare this variable current time, um, but I'm not gonna assign it a value right away. And that's fine, right? I'm just gonna tell the program, hey, there's a variable called current time. I promise I'm gonna assign it a value uh, before we actually need it for something. Take a quick look uh, at the comments. 
probably have turns on LEDs above the yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that would be very an LED above each active camera would be super helpful. Um, I'm I'm always tempted to just leave it in this view, but I think it's a view that's like a little bit creepy, um, and you maybe can't see the programming very well. But here we are. Um, let's see, Millie's is an unsigned long. Oh, so we can get up to four point two billion. Yes, so um, still millions and millions of seconds is better than. 65 uh, 65 seconds is the takeaway. Um, let's come back over here to the code. So we declared our variable called current time. Um, I guess I'm not going to do anything in setup. Um, but what I will do is come down to our loop here. Oh, hey, let's no, let's do let's I I know. I was trying to think how are we going to display some kind of output based on the time, but I think I have an idea. Um, so we're going to define our LED pin to be pin 2 like we have before. Um, we're going to do pin mode, LED pin output, like we have before, right? We're going to use the same wiring that we've been using all night, so it works out really great. Um, and down here in our loop, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say current time equals millis. And I got to put a semicolon there. Um, so current time, right? We declared it up here to be a, a long integer, so I don't need to put long down here, right? We already know what it is. Current. Uh, yeah, I'm mixing my tenses again, my cases again, but it's my stream. So current time equals millis. And this millis function returns the number of milliseconds since the program started running. Um, so it will basically, now that it's a long integer, basically count upwards forever. Um, and now I can do something with this value like so. I'm going to use an if statement. There's a lot of if statements, right? So uh, parentheses and oops, curly brackets, as we usually do. Right, we'll do a new block. We've in, it's indented it for us, which is great. Um, and I'm going to say if something uh, turn the LED on, digital right LED pin high. Uh, and I'm going to do my else block. Right, same thing. If if this is not true, digital right LED pin low, turn the LED pin off. Right. So here's what I'm going to do for my conditional. I'm going to say if current time modulo 500 is uh less than 250 do something so what have we done there so this modulo operator you might remember from math class and it's usually not written like this if you're doing math homework but this is how you'd write it in code returns the remainder when you divide the first number by the second number right so I'll give you some examples um uh 1001 let's comment this out Ooh, block comments Right. If you want to write multiple comments in a row, do slash star, and you can write lots of comments and they all don't do anything. Right? Great feature. Um, so just to give you some examples, 1001 mod uh, 2 is 1. Because you divide 1001 by 2 and your remainder is 1. Right? Uh, 1001 mod uh, 500 is also one, right? Because a thousand divided by a thousand and one divided by five hundred is two remainder one, right? A uh, thousand and one mod. Oh, let's see, a thousand and eleven mod two is also one. It's an odd number. A uh, thousand and eleven mod five hundred is eleven, right? This sort of started to make sense, right? We're just taking, we're dividing it as many times as we can, and then taking the remainder. Um, it's a it's a pretty useful function for something like this. Um. So what I've done up here is say if current time modulo 500, so take the current time, divide it by 500. If it's less than 250, uh, turn the LED on. If it's, it, or else really, if it's more than 250, turn the LED off. Let's upload that code. And assuming I haven't made a typo, which it doesn't look like I have, I'll come back over here. And now we'll see we have our LED flashing again, turning on and off uh, twice a second, right? So why is that? Well. Really what we've done is say, so this current time is counting up by a thousand milliseconds every second by definition, right? So we'll divide, so this, we're going to be incrementing by a thousand every second. So we're going to pass this mark of, you know, rolling over at 500 milliseconds twice a second. And uh, if that value, which will go from zero to 500, zero to 500, zero to 500, if it's less than 250, turn the LED on. Otherwise, turn the LED off, right? I can change the duty cycle, if you will, of this by changing this second value. Right, so now this current this current time mod 500 going from zero to 500, zero to 500, it's on whenever we're less than 400. So it's on 80% of the time. So we come over here, you'll see it's mostly on with a little bit of off. 
and so on. And, you know, if this was something we were going to do often in our program, we could wrap this in another function. We could say, you know, give it a, a duty cycle parameter, an on time parameter, and something like that. The nice thing about this, and this starts to get towards your question, Chris, is that nowhere in this code do I have a delay, right? I'm just checking on the current time of execution and taking some action based on it, right? So um, now I can also do something like this. If current time mod, well, let's do, uh, I don't know, mod, uh, I don't know, three quarters of a second is less than uh, three eighths of a second, uh, I want to digital write to the built-in LED high. And if we're not in that time interval else, we're going to turn that LED off, right? Let's upload that code. We come back to the table. Oh, you know what I did? I didn't declare that output LED, that built-in LED is an output pin mode. Uh, LED built-in. There's nothing special about this LED built-in pin. It, it, it's literally just because different brands, or not brands, but different species of Arduino boards have different uh, built-in LEDs. Most of the time it's on pin 13, sometimes it's on pin six. They give you this variable called LED built-in so that when you run that first blink sketch, because it's the one you get out of the box, it always works, right? So we'll declare that as an output. We come back to the table. And now we should see now they're blinking out of sequence with each other, right? This one is flashing with a duty cycle of 80% uh, every half second. This one is duty, uh, flashing with a duty cycle of 50% every three quarters of a second. So you can, I think you can sort of start to see how we are able to, instead of doing something and then waiting till the next time it's supposed to happen, we can now um, check on the current time and then see, and, and based on that time, make a choice. Does that sort of make sense? This sort of starts to get to your how do we do multiple things at once question. And of course, right, as we're thinking about combining things with each other, uh, the do a thing at a certain time doesn't necessarily have to be uh, only flash an LED. It could be at this time, look for an input or if, you know, if at this time and this input do a thing, otherwise do something else, right? It's all combinable all the way down. Um, so, um, so the, the actual example you posed, Chris, which is like reset the counter when you're in the middle of flashing, this might, this not be not exactly how I would write it, but you can sort of see now that my LED is flashing independent of delay, I could, uh, <laughs> I could start, um, integrating the like reading a button function in the middle of this and I wouldn't be hosed because I'm not delaying for anything anymore. We've run out of time so let's start talking about time. <laughs> yeah I, I when I said this was a tight 90 I guess that was aspirational um, but uh, but I feel about okay about where we've ended up um, but since we're coming up on two hours I think we will probably start to draw this to a close. Um, but the, the one question as I, as I start to sort of tidy things up here that I wanted to put out to you is, um, what other, <laughs> feels like a simpleton? No, Palmer, no, I, I, we, we didn't, I didn't do a great demo. I think this is where we will, we will probably pick up next time. Um, I think we will, um, uh, start with this question of how do I do multiple things at once? Because it's pretty key to to doing um, interesting things with your Arduino, right? Like we don't necessarily want to be limited to just, if you're building a robot, I don't want to just move a motor at one singular speed. I want it to be able to react and move in various different ways. Um, when my pizza of an example from earlier is going on, I don't want to be um, wait, you know, telling my pizza peel to move into the oven and then not checking on it until it gets there, right? I don't want to say pizza peel motor on, delay three seconds, and then, you know, hopefully we're not hosed by then. I want it to be interactive the whole time. And this sort of gets to, um, sort of, sort of gets to the heart of that. Uh, Chris says, stream deck to switch between OBS streams. Oh, uh, <laughs> Chris has a streaming question. I'm actually using the OBS, the stream deck app on my phone, which I like a lot. Um, it's $3 a month and it has a one month free trial. So, Never a bad time to start. Um, but yeah, I think this is where we will, we should pick up next week is uh, with 
uh, strategies for making an Arduino do multiple things at once. Um, the other things I would like to talk about next week are um, analog inputs and analog outputs. So um, let's say you want to control something not with just a switch, but with a rotary knob, right? Something like that. Um, or with a slider or, um, or any of a number of sensors that output analog values. Um, like uh, a lot of light sensors of output an analog value, right? It's like, it's not just on or off, it's how much light am I outputting or how much heat am I receiving or something like that. So we'll look at analog inputs and we'll also look at analog outputs, right? How the Arduino can generate not just an on or an off, but on some of its pins can generate something that approximates a, a dimming value, right? This is how you would dim an LED or approximate an analog value to go into an analog circuit like a comparator or a speaker or something like that. Um, those are those are sort of two more sort of core fundamental skills. Um, and as I'm saying that loud, let's talk about uh, the serial monitor next week, because uh, which is a way of uh, making your Arduino generate text messages, essentially, and sending them back into your computer for either for data logging or communication or communication with other programs or uh, as a really useful way of debugging, right? It could be like when switch is pressed, turn LED on. Could also be when switch is pressed, send message to computer saying switch is pressed. It's a really useful technique. Um, but in the meantime, I hope this was fun. I hope we learned something. Um, I, hope you, I, I hope you took something away and thank you for asking questions. Like it's always useful to know where people are coming from um, and what they've gotten into and what they wanna know about. Um, we'll plan to be back here. Um, or at least we, I'll plan to be back here uh, next Sunday night, same bat time, same bat channel, 7 p.m. Central. Um, and we'll we'll pick up from where we left off. I'm also, I have this dream, because um, this sort of stream came out of the idea of, you know, I, for a long time I've wanted to be like, hey, everyone who has an Arduino kit in their closet, like, come sit on my couch, drink beer, and make stuff. And, you know, these days that's not as possible as it used to be. Um, but I love the idea of people sort of sharing things that they have made. So not not in the coming week, so next Sunday will be our next one, but sometime maybe the week after that, I'd love to start up sort of a midweek hangout stream. Um, and I don't know quite technologically how that's gonna work, um, but maybe it'll be a chance to like, we get people in via Google Hangouts um, or in the chat or sharing pictures or I, I don't know what, and people can sort of show off either what they've made since we started talking about this or things that they've made in the past or or maybe just like, questions they have and we'll have sort of a, a more chill chat time so anyway that's just something i'm musing about if that sounds interesting and you have ideas for how that would work um feel free to let me know uh, chris says zoom meeting i mean we're all pros at zoom now right we could do a zoom um i think it'd be fun to do like i we had a test at first do a zoom on stream right so some participants can come in and talk and people who just want to watch can can just watch i know zoom does that but this, the stream environment's kind of nice and is recorded, right? So people can come back and watch it later, um, which I think is a kind of a fun thing. So that's, those details aren't really figured out yet, but um, you know, in, in a couple of weeks, I think we'll, we'll try and put that out there. Cause I really, I'm, I, I wanna see what other people are making out there. Um, any case, thank you guys. This was super fun for me. Um, this was a really interesting, and I hope that it has given you sort of, at least if you had never touched this before, enough basis to pull that kit out of your closet or buy like the $12 kit on Amazon and plug it in an Arduino and start playing around. Places, if you're like hankering for knowledge in the next week to look for more information, um, we talked about the uh, Arduino reference on arduino.cc and all of the uh, code references that it has. You can also, of course, always dig through these example sketches in your uh, file menu in your Arduino IDE, right? We mostly looked at the basic ones, but they have digital examples, they have analog examples, they have controller. Like, so if you're really looking for examples of how to do things, this is kind of a cool place to start. And of course, one of the reasons that Arduino is popular is it's been popular for so long and people on the internet have done a lot of this stuff. If you Google Arduino pizza peel controller, I would bet next week's beer no, I won't do that. I would bet that someone has made one and you can look at what they've done for examples. Um, in any case, folks, uh, thank you so much. I will see you uh, next week. Thanks, everybody.